I really noticed me growing is when we got involved with community groups and small groups. Back home in Texas, we went to a public school, so all of our friend group was not primarily Christians. And it was very toxic to be in that environment with being a Christian and trying to live that life, but having all these people who drag you down. And there was definitely more bad than good, so we got dragged along with it. Mm -hmm. Not blaming the blame on them, but, or putting the blame on them, but I mean, it was definitely our own choice. But being in community groups and small groups definitely puts you in that community to have Christian friends that you know you can trust and having Christian friends that help encourage you to grow. And once you do have those types of friends, it's a lot easier to be yourself and a lot easier to be a Christian with them as well because that's, that's our whole, what our whole life should be based on. Yeah, and I mean, like when we have Christian friends they're there to hold us accountable and they're there for us when the darkest times hit. A lot of times, like whenever I can think back onto the friends that, you know, that weren't Christians, I mean, of course you have exceptions. A lot of times whenever stuff would hit the fan, it was like, where are they, you know? But up here, we've been surrounded by such a strong community and, and friendship and really family now. It's like, when we're having a hard time, I have no problem coming to my brothers and sisters and saying, hey, like, Either I get personal, personal with some of them, saying like, this is exactly what I'm struggling with, or it's just like, hey, can you guys please pray for me? And I think we do that, uh, an amazing job with the, the group that we have now, with the Multiply group, is, you know, we can send in little requests like, hey, please pray for me, having a rough day or something like that. And that like, those prayers help, man, for sure. Because prayer is like one of the biggest uh, tools that we can use. Because of the way that we've grown, not only as a couple, but as individuals, it's a lot easier to help others grow as well. And the way I see myself doing this is by going to work and just treating everybody with love because work can be a very hard place and work can be a very dreadful place of like, oh my goodness, I have to get up early again. Like. I have to go see this person who's really mean to me or just anything like that. Even if you're in school, that could be a dreadful time in school as well. But treating others in love and encouraging them and being able to pray for them in moments that they need prayer. Because once you create that bond of I'm your friend, I'm not here to attack you and I'm here to love you, they're going to be able to come to you with certain circumstances going on at home and you have the amazing mm -hmm. opportunity to bring Christ into that moment and to say, let me pray for you because I know I can't help, but I know who, someone who can. Bringing it to the youth, I feel very blessed to be a part of that ministry because it like really brings me so much joy of seeing these students when they're young or when they first come and seeing how it might be really intimidating coming to the burning, but it's so much fun. But getting able to see how they're growing with their walk with Christ, mm -hmm. I feel so blessed by that. And to just know that that is such a huge thing to be a part of, like that's a part of their eternity. And I, we're pouring out into that life and it just really blesses me. And it brings me so much joy to just be there for the students and to see how we're helping them grow to see how they're helping others not only us like pouring into them but they're now pouring out to other people at their schools just because they see us doing it here you know they might see you they look up to us so it's very nice to see how we're pouring out into them and they're seeing the call that they also have upon their lives so they have to fulfill that too so it's nice to see how you grow and others once you're helping them grow as well. Amen. I have to just echo everything they said. I have been the community group pastor here at Calvary for the past two years. And my life has grown dramatically and exponentially doing life with other people, with other believers. And uh, tonight, you may not have expected to hear that. Do I have any introverts in the room? 
not digging that at all, right? You know, stretching you big time. Uh, but I have to say that tonight is very, a very passionate topic for me. I am very convinced that God always intended that we were to grow in community more than alone. And I'm praying tonight you would have an open heart to, to listen to this uh, and to really receive this as a way of growing. And I just need you to understand something. I don't want you to think that we use people to grow. I want to make sure I get that out there right in the beginning. The idea isn't to use people to grow. What I'm saying is, is that when we pour into people, we just, we must grow. We have no choice but to grow because the more you get with people, the more you realize you don't know and how much they need to learn and how much they don't know. And every situation can be different. Everyone can be different. Uh, I go to Caesar Rodney High School to talk in their world religions class and uh, they ask about Christianity and it's really cool because we get to have a Q&A and I'm blown away at the, all the different questions that these students ask about the, the, the faith of Christianity. And usually they're very hostile. Usually they, they, they're kind of coming against me in Christianity. But then I kind of try to turn it towards love and try to love them and show them how Christ loves them. But what's interesting is, is when I started doing that, it really forced me to do what? To study. To grow. And then when you get 20 different questions that don't relate to each other, and you're like, wow, that's a lot of studying I have to do. But I have to tell you, I've learned more from being challenged than staying by myself, never helping anyone. I discovered in my own life, too, that practicing spiritual disciplines like last night, reading the Bible, we cover just reading the Bible because it's so important and it takes a lot of time. But, you know, prayer, serving, uh, solitude, all those spiritual disciplines that the Bible shows us um, and Richard Foster opens up in his uh, Celebration of Discipline book, all those things are very powerful alone. They are. It's powerful to be alone with God. You need that alone time with him. But here's the thing. I found that practicing spiritual disciplines, such as reading the Bible and praying, if I did that in a community, they came alive. They came alive. Now imagine being in a room with eight people. We all read the same scripture but because they've all come from different backgrounds and circumstances in life, they look at that one message of that scripture that is definitely true. I'm not talking about eight different interpretations of the scripture because that would be false interpret interpretations, okay? The Bible, okay, let me give you an example of that. Um, the Bible talks about be thankful in all circumstances, right? It's not that they come in and think of it eight different ways and misinterpret scripture. What I'm saying is, is once we agree that this is what the scripture means, all of them have gone through situations that can be applied differently. Their context, thankfulness looks different than my context. I'll give you an example. Someone who's been raised in the slums all their life and now they're doing okay, they're gonna be grateful for things that are different than me. So that's the beauty of doing life and, and practicing spiritual disciplines in community. If, if I went to Dominican Republic right now, certain scriptures, that when I went there for a mission trip, certain scriptures meant something different for them than it did for me because of the context in which they lived. I am convinced though that my spiritual growth, that your spiritual growth is expedited and grows exponentially when I'm in fellowship and community with other believers. And you already know this to be true because right now you are practicing or experiencing that. Today, tonight you worship together and it was inspiring to see others worship. It encourages you that there's others like you to worship with and you're learning from someone else right now. And every Sunday you go to church, you've already been experiencing the benefits of doing life in community. Okay, so it's not like we don't already agree with this, but tonight I'm gonna press in a little harder and shrink that community into spiritual fellowship between two and three people and spiritual fellowship within a group. When I submerge myself in community, I learned a lot about what I didn't know, what I needed to grow in, and also what others needed to grow in. So our bottom line tonight, I'm giving it right away in the beginning, is that we grow more together than alone. And I wanna go back to our first scripture of the first night, and one of the most important scriptures we have was Romans 8, 29. Because remember, this whole week, 
is becoming more like Christ, is growing. Growing is to become more like Jesus. And Romans 8, 29 says this, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So it's God's desire all week and it's always been before this Grow Conference week to conform and transform us into the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. This means we are becoming more like Christ because that's what God wants. Here's what's interesting about Jesus. Jesus did life in community. He didn't do it in isolation. Jesus did life with others because he was busy doing something we call making disciples. Followers of Jesus is what a disciple is. But a disciple is more than just a follower of Jesus. A disciple is someone who helps other people follow Jesus. And so Jesus, this is his life. This is his identity. And if Romans 8, 29 is true, that means that we are also supposed to become like Jesus even in this area. If we're not making disciples, I'm gonna be kind of bold right here with this statement. This means that if we're not making disciples, we are missing out on becoming more like Jesus. If we're not helping other people follow Jesus, are we truly growing into the potential of who we were always meant to be according to the scripture of Romans 8, 29? In other words, you may not see yourself right now as a disciple maker who helps people follow Jesus, but that's who God intends you to be. And if you're willing to yield to his work in your life, if you're willing to put yourself in, uh, in line with him, he's going to take you to that level. But I think a lot of us don't see us at that level because it kind of like night one or night two, right? When Jody was talking about the brokenness, I could never do that. I, I'm not good enough. I don't have the gifts and the talents. I'm not like Ryan, I can't get on stage. Good, I don't want you to. I want you to be out there where I can't. A lot of times we look at ourselves and, and we just don't see that we're worthy. I, I remember when Peter and them, they saw Jesus and they said, get away from me, we are unholy, we're not worthy. And, and Jesus comes to him and is like, I love you. I, I'm calling you to follow me, to be fishers of men. Like Jesus sees potential in you that you don't even see in yourself. And the reason why is because Jesus know, uh, knew that God's plan all along was to make you a disciple that would change this world. So every day and every week and every month and every year we resist growing into this new life of making disciples. We're actually stifling our growth. And I'm, I'm going to dare to say, too, that your Christian walk will not feel fulfilled or fulfilling or exciting if it's all about coming to church only. I call that boring Christianity. I'm not, gonna, I'm not joking. I would be bored as a Christian. I've been raised in church. I'm a pastor's kid. Now I'm a I'm pastor, right? I can't believe I, this is on tape right now. But I would be bored if that's all Christianity was, was going to church. Do you guys understand my heart behind that? Okay. Just so if you're new here, I get real. I don't know if you noticed that yet. And it's funny because people go, I just don't feel like I'm growing. I don't feel like I'm getting fed. Yada, yada, yada. That, that's one of the things that, ah, oh, man, I got to be careful what I say, but. Sometimes it's not really about us getting fed. I mean, how many times do we have to go to church before we realize we're supposed to be feeding others? You know? The joy of leading someone to salvation and helping believers through that sanctification process we talked about on Monday night, that becoming holy and becoming like Jesus. Yes, God the Holy Spirit, the Bible, Jesus, all of them working together is helping you overcome your past, putting on the new nature of Jesus Christ so that you can do good works. We broke that down the first night. All of that, the joy of doing that with someone else is what we should be living for as a believer. 
I mean, I cannot spend the next, I'm 35. Let's say I live till I'm 80. Let me do the math in my head real quick. 45. I can't spend the next 45 years just coming here and constantly receiving. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be an unhappy Christian. Because I, there's only so many things that you can work on in my life. There's only so many things. I mean, how long is it going to take for God to make me whole, you know? And the thing is, is even if I still have brokenness in me, he wants to use broken people to help other broken people. So this is extremely important tonight that we understand that, that God has created you to help others and that's going to require us to live in community with others. And I want to cover three ways that we live in community. And really there's four, and that's the corporate body coming together like tonight. And so Sunday mornings is, is really important. But I, I have to tell you, if, if you come to Calvary and you come here long enough, you're going to hear me talk about this a lot because every time I talk to people about how they're doing with their Christian faith, they go right to church attendance. And I'm like, stop doing that. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ before you get here, way before you get here. It's Monday morning, you know? And then, yeah, I haven't been reading my Bible. I haven't been praying. That's not the only Christian thing we do, by the way. We go and help people know Christ and help them read their Bibles and pray. All right, we get it. I'm gonna go, let me keep going. Number one, the first way we do this, the first way we live in community is, is make disciples or discipleship. Jesus created that. He was an expert at forming the first discipleship community when he called the 12 to follow him. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Wow, if he's not trying to set himself up as like, right? Like he's not doing this in an arrogant way, but he's saying there's a lot of authority behind this statement. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he wants us to go. He wants us to pursue people with the goal in mind to help them change the world or be disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that's your water baptism. We don't just do that to do that. We do that to, to help you identify yourself as a follower, a disciple of Jesus. And by the way, if they were water baptized in the Bible times after Jesus' uh, crucifixion and resurrection, it was a risk, it was a danger to do that because the Jews wanted to destroy Christians. The Romans were, Romans were coming after them. It was persecution season, so to say, after Jesus rose and ascended into heaven. And so if you were being water baptized out in public or something, it was radical. You were telling everyone around you that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ no matter what. It wasn't like we hid inside of a place and, and then did it. They were bold about this wherever there was water enough to be immersed. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Have any of you been in a teaching session one time with someone and that was it? Just, just one day you spent learning everything you need to learn in one day. Any of you? No. Do you know what that implies? That it's going to take time to teach new disciples to obey everything I have commanded them. This scripture is implying that we must spend time in relationship with people, helping them understand the scriptures, helping them understand what God said to do. Now, what's the commands? Because we know the Old Testament commands were fulfilled in Jesus Christ, meaning that we don't necessarily have to fulfill the, uh, or to obey the, all the other extra commands, but we do have the moral commands, the Ten Commandments, right? There was other commands too, like don't have your hair this length, don't wear this, right? Those were not the same commands that God's talking about here or Jesus is talking about here. The commands, the 10 commandments are wrapped up in two commandments, Jesus says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. The first four commandments have to do with you loving God in the Old Testament. The last six have to do with you loving each other in community. 
By the way, the commandments, the Ten Commandments were giving, given to them so they could live in a civil community where they didn't kill each other. So again, commands were supposed to keep unity within the body of Christ. But then Jesus adds more to it and he says, another command I'm giving you, right? Right here is to make disciples. So it's not just love God and love others within the body or outside the body of Christ, but now go make disciples. So we're supposed to help new believers or those who are completely lost believe in Jesus. Let's start with that. Jesus is saying, live in community, help a lost person follow me, and then teach them how to love God, love one another, and then also make disciples. Now, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, personally. Because that's the clearest imperatives I've ever seen in Scripture, if I've ever read any in my life. I mean, that is what Jesus wants me to do with my life. If you're a mechanic, he still wants you to do that with your life. You just do it in a different context than me. If you're a mom, a stay-at-home mom, oh, man, you have a great opportunity with your children. And then any, any friends or neighbors nearby or moms that want to hang out with you. If you're in the Air Force, you are practically a missionary because they keep sending you around everywhere. Unless you're in Dover, it's over, right? That's what they say. Sorry about that. If that is, has been your story. Hey, Dover, Delaware is not that bad. But here's what's really important. When the disciples started making disciples, they were able to make disciples because they had first been a disciple. And what I'm trying to say is, is that we have to actually follow Jesus to know where we're leading people. And so Jesus is pretty much saying like to his followers, he's given them their next steps for life and what they're gonna do. And honestly, we are here today because they followed Jesus' example of living in community, making disciples. If the church did not do what they were supposed to do, if they did not obey Jesus' commands, we would not be sitting in this room right now. I guarantee you that. You can read the book of Acts to see how it actually worked. But to, the command to make disciples in itself grows us. That's not the reason why we're going to do it. Hey, let me go help people follow Jesus because I want to grow. That's selfish, right? That's not the point I'm trying to say. The byproduct of you helping someone else grow is that you're going to grow. It forces you to grow. Because why? Because we follow and obey Jesus and we help others do the same. And think about it for a second. By being a disciple maker who helps other people follow Jesus, you have to be close enough to Jesus to also live out the life of Jesus. Because the greatest way we can teach people how to follow Jesus is not through words, but also actions. And in order for us to really like contextualize and help people visualize what it means to follow Jesus, we ourselves have to show that and model it out for them. My children can hear me say something all day, but if they see me do it, they're actually going to learn something. You know what I mean? That's even for even listening. You know how that is. I hear teenagers are worse. We'll see. I know that actually. No, sorry, teenagers in here. You got a bad rep when it comes to that, but it's like, well, I just saw a post recently. It's like, talking to a youth is like talking to a wall or something, I don't know. But that's not always the case. So. <laughs> My wife says that about me sometimes. No. So the question I have for you as we go further in is who are you helping grow right now? Who are you helping grow right now? And the reality is that I guarantee you God has been bringing someone in your life that you, have, you were supposed to help. That person you walk by at work, that student you walk by at college or school, not anymore because of break, but that person you go and see every time at the grocery store, that person in church that's new that needs help getting connected and growing. God's been bringing someone in your life to help grow. So I want to encourage you to help someone else grow and find that one that you're supposed to pour into. Okay, Ryan, the Bible is clear. I need to make disciples. 
how do I do that? How do I actually do that? Well, I want to give you uh, a couple examples that happen to be the other two ways we grow in community. And the second one is spiritual fellowship. Spiritual fellowship is a relationship of two or more believers who want to help each other grow in Christ. Now, some of us who lead someone to Jesus, they may not really understand the, the importance of growing yet. That's why my first night of Grow Conference was the theology or the reason or study of why we need to grow and why we should grow. And so sometimes you have to help a new believer understand that they're supposed to keep going, that you're supposed to continue to follow Jesus, not just receive him for salvation, but follow him. Scripture gives us a number of examples of the importance and value of spiritual fellowship. Uh, let's go to Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen. Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen. I'm going to use the New Living Translation. You probably have heard this before. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. I tried to, to explain this to my son Connor this past week, and it was like an Ava, and I was, it looked like Ava thought I was talking about swords and cutting each other, and that was funny. So that was interesting to explain Proverbs to your children. But it was worth the challenge, you know. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. So when two people come together and share what God has been teaching them individually, it promotes a stronger and healthier growth, as well as insight into, into even more faithful, sharper, Christ-like living. So who's in your life, and who, or who could you be for someone that's going to help them think about things they never thought about when it comes to Christ? Who's in your life that's actually pushing you towards Christ? I want you to take a moment to think about that for a second. Because when we do surveys about like, raise your hand if someone's come to you and evangelized to you recently. Actually, let's do a survey. If you've been evangelized by another Christian in the past two months, or let's go even further, four months, raise your hand. A Christian evangelized you. Did you guys hear my question? If a Christian came to you asking you if you know Jesus and if you want to believe in Jesus, raise your hand. Wow, we got some evangelism going on in Dover, Delaware, or wherever you live. So a few. Okay, I'm going to ask you another question. In the past two to three months, raise your hand if a Christian has come to you and said, how are you doing spiritually with God? How's your spiritual health? Raise your hand. Yes, good, much better. If you have a friend that's looking after you and your spiritual health, keep that friend close. We need that in our lives. It's hard to find that sometimes. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 4. I actually have to go to the front of my Bible to find out where that is. I always lose this one. The church board's reevaluating their hire of, <laughs> of uh, Pastor Ryan. <laughs> For some reason, I always think it's after the minor prophets. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. Jody referred to this on Tuesday night, right? But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. It is actually a known fact that two or more people can get more work done, produce more work than, obviously, one person. They can double, triple, quadruple their work when they work together. I love Hebrews 3. It goes really along with this scripture of the importance of having someone in your life. Now, I know where Hebrews is. It's funny. 
Hebrews 3, verse 13. And I'm going to really start with verse 12. I read this the other night as well. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. And here's the key verse. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. So it is awesome to have someone in your life who would be willing to warn you of the dangers of your behaviors or even thoughts and decisions. And then we'll go to uh, James chapter 5. By the way, James is after Hebrews. One of my favorite verses when it comes to this topic. James 5, 19 through 20. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. And I wrote in my Bible underneath that because I like to write notes in my Bible and, it, and I wrote this. Sometimes it takes a fellow believer to show you how far you've wandered off. Sometimes you just don't realize how far you've gotten away from God. And so it takes someone who's got your back to let you know, hey, you're not the person you're supposed to be. You're not looking like Christ, acting like Christ, behaving like Christ. Hebrews 10, 24, I have this on the screen for you, through 25, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So we actually need each other to encourage and spur and, and push each other towards love and good deeds. And unfortunately, as we get busier in life or as we become more isolated with things in our lives because of hurt or past experiences, we begin to give up meeting together. But here's the thing I want you to think about tonight that I often teach people this. A lot of times when we stop being in the church and getting with others and helping them and encouraging them, a lot of times we, we, we're looking at ourselves and we're going, ah, you know, I'm, I can't do that. I'm not doing good. And we go on and on and on, right? Do you know what the result of that is? Someone else just missed out on your encouragement. You see what I'm saying? Like when we're down for the count, someone else is suffering too. Because God wants to use you to encourage someone else. And to spur one another on to his love and good deeds. And so that's why Tuesday night was so important. Because we wanted you to be healed and to find that direction towards healing, healing and wholeness. Because we want you to be able to pour into other people and not count yourself out. And by the way, the enemy wants to make sure you're not effective. And he wants to sideline you real bad. And he wants to cripple you and think that you can't do anything in the kingdom of God. But the reality is, is with God's help, we can do anything. All things are possible through Christ who gives us strength. Amen. Jerry Bridges says something about this verse. He says, this cannot be done sitting in pews either. Row upon row, listening to the pastor teach. It can only be done through the mutual interchange of admonition or admonishment and encouragement. So in other words, when we come to church and gather and then we come in and we sit down and we worship and we give our tithes and offerings and we listen to the announcements and we listen to pastor teach and then we leave, we're actually missing a very important ingredient of being the body of Christ and that's spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. And right now, you are unable to do that because you're listening to me teach, aren't you? And during worship, you can't because the music's up and you're, you're singing, right? But during the altar time, we can. And that's why Calvary still has altar time and we'll always, we call altar the front. It was just something that someone made a long time ago. It's church and ease, okay? It's church language for space away from everyone else or space up here with everyone else to let God work on you instead of back in your seat where you may be distracted with little children or whatever. 
I know for me as a youth, you're a teenager, I need to get away from my friends or at least away from the crowd so I can get real with God, but then they would come and pray for me, which I really appreciated. That's why we have an altar ministry. That's why we have time up here together. Can we do it back in the seats? Absolutely, please do. So how can we have this type of fellowship? Well, I already said it earlier. First, we have to have our own fellowship with God in order to offer anything spiritual to others, don't we? So you have to fill up your bottle, so to say, so you can pour out. And mine's disappearing because I'm thirsty. And then secondly, we must have a mutual commitment to one another. We must be committed to getting together, committed to being honest and transparent and confidential and looking out for each other. And I love what Jerry Bridges says to this. He says, this does not mean that we transfer the responsibility for our Christian walk to one another. In other words, I'm not supposed to live out, for example, Sam's Christian walk and do all the work for him. We're committed to both putting in work to grow. So if I come to, to time, let's say Sam and I are hanging out for fellowship, we actually did today, but not for intentional Bible study. But what I would do is I would read the scripture, he would read the scripture, he would pray on it, see what God's trying to teach according to the scripture so it's not misinterpreted. I do the same thing and then we talk about how we both could apply it and I'm getting ahead of myself. But that is him being committed versus just me doing all the work and he didn't do anything. Okay, so it's a mutual commitment to doing that. It's a mutual commitment of him praying for me and I'm praying for him. So here's some practical suggestions for fellowship. So what you can do in your fellowship time with someone. I'm giving you stuff that's really practical tonight because I'm trying to equip you to not just enjoy a conference, but to enjoy every day growing in Christ. Okay, I have no apologies for taking time to do practical stuff like this because it's gonna help you do what we've always been wanting to do, nurture and help people. So the first thing we do is we share biblical truth. So this is, I mean, this is such an important page. The next two pages are so important. If you were to literally start discipling someone and helping someone follow Jesus, what do you actually do? I love this. The first thing is you share biblical truth. Spiritual fellowship should always revolve around biblical truth. Two people can come together after reading the same scripture on their own and share what God had showed them. And a practical tip would be to write down what you learned in a journal so you can share what insights you found. How have you grown through them and how have you applied it to your daily life? The second one is transparency. Spiritual fellowship is openness to share your struggles and sin. I said it. I said sin. And I said sharing it. Like sharing your struggles and sin. Who in here doesn't sin? Raise your hand. I got to put my hand back down. Right. We all sin. We all fall short of God's glory standard. We all mess up. Let's not be ashamed of that. Let's actually seek help. And let's also be the person who will receive that and not shove it in someone's face, right? Share temptations. Everyone's tempted. Failures, but also your joys and blessings. I love that. What's your wins for the week, man? Like, yeah, well, I got to share my faith with someone. Win. I want you to know that too. This should be a mutual experience. Transparency, though, requires trust and confidentiality. You cannot have true transparency if you don't trust each other and you have confidentiality. So sometimes this doesn't come up when you first start hanging out together because it takes time to build trust so that you'll get transparent. Whenever I do groups or whenever I start mentoring someone, I don't go, what are you sinning? What, do you do? what kind of sin are you in? You know, that's not, my first, that's not my first step, you know what I mean? Like, let's get to know them, you know. Good grief. And this type of culture is so important in Christianity and it needs to grow among us because James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. But it is very hard to do this, but it is possible when you're in a spiritual fellowship that allows it without condemnation or shaming. And without this community, without this connection, Ultimately, we cannot encourage, spur, or pray for each other if we don't know what someone is going through. 
we have to get real and go, what are you going through so I can pray about these things instead of you suffering in silence? We should never suffer in silence. That's what I loved about Tuesday night when Jody was saying that, you know, the scripture talks about how it's better to have a sad face than the happy one. I can't remember, it was in Ecclesiastes. It was the weirdest verse I ever read. But it was true. Don't hide the real you because now you're delaying your healing. Show what's really going on so that God can begin to do work with you and people can come and pray for you and encourage you. Thirdly, we need to hold each other accountable. If there's a mutual agreement to read scripture, pray, serve our family and friends, remain pure in our private lives and so on, then we need to be willing to be held accountable. Holding each other accountable to be faithful in spiritual disciplines is paramount. So reading your Bible, praying, serving. We also hold each other accountable to Christ-like character, such as the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, self-control. I mean, tons of scripture. (laughs) There's so much scripture that we're supposed to apply. We can't do that on our own. We need community to help us do that. And I'll get into that soon. I recently shared with our young adults that in our community group that we have, that if we took the initiative to confess our sins to one another, we wouldn't have to be corrected by one another. If we took the initiative to confess our sins, we wouldn't actually have to be corrected. Now, are there some sins we don't see? Yeah. So sometimes it takes someone else to see it. But if we were humble enough to let the word of God correct us by being in our word, by the way, can I just tell you something? I want God's word to correct me first. So when I hang out in God's word, I need to have an open heart to go, I'm not applying this. I need to apply it. Correct me, Lord. You know what I mean? Like if we go to the Bible, like we've already arrived, we probably won't get much from it. So we have to humble ourselves when we read the Bible and we have to let God the one who knows everything and who is perfect and holy do a work on us. If we don't go to the Bible in humility, you're wasting your time. You might as well close it and try the next time. Right? Do I sound mean when I say this stuff right now? Or do I sound like I love you? I just want to make sure it's love, right? Tough love. But the thing is, is the reason why I get like this is because this was me. It was me. I would go to the word like I didn't need anything. I just need to preach a sermon for someone, especially when I was my, my first year in youth ministry. <laughs> I'd do nothing wrong, you know. Oh, I feel bad for my youth leaders. <clears throat> Thank God for maturity and growing. <laughs> but I want to go back to this real quick, that's, that's saying. Let's connect with God so we can confess our sins and let him correct us. The three C's. Connect, confess, and correct. Let him correct us. All right? Or it might be connect and then he corrects us because we don't see it and then we confess he's right. (laughs) Whatever it is. But sometimes you need someone to do that. Can I just encourage you to be receptive when you get into this kind of spiritual fellowship? Be receptive. This is what you do. You, you take a deep breath when someone gets real with you. <sighs> okay. And you, you go through a filter. Have all mankind sinned? Yes. Am I perfect? No. Is it, is it possible that I sinned? Yes. Could this person be right? Yes. What does the Bible say? Okay, yes, I did. All right, I received that correction from that brother in Christ. That's actually not that hard but it's just that we put up such a prideful thing. Like we put up a prideful wall. And what's crazy is that person that's calling that out is just caring about your growth and your walk with God. They're not trying to like one up you and be better than you spiritually. Hopefully that should be the way it is. I was corrected by a brother in Christ a long time ago. Um, I like, I think I might've been here. I might've been at college. And I gotta be honest with you, I have never forgotten that that kind of brutal correction it wasn't he didn't do it brutally but it was just it hurt a lot 
But you know what's crazy? I can't get that out of my head because I saw sincere love in his face about my spiritual walk and how he's like, I don't want you to compromise. You've already started compromising. Don't, don't do it, man. That really hit me and touched me. And I really thank that guy a lot. It's incredible. And lastly, we need to pray. We do prayer together. So prayer communicates care. And when we hear each other out and lift those needs to God, you're doing one of the most loving things you can, you can for your fellow believer. Prayer also promotes thinking less of yourself and having compassion and concern for the interests of others. Like if you can sit down and listen to someone's prayer need and not think of what you're already going to say, just listen. Understand and then validate and then pray. So as we can see, these spiritual, the spiritual fellowship with two or more people really does promote gro growth, and it's supposed to. So who are we meeting together with to promote healthy Christ-like living and growth in smaller fellowships, spiritual fellowship, two or, or three people? Maybe four. Who are we meeting with? And if you don't have someone yet, I want to pray, I pray for you, and I want to encourage you that you do that and you use this example of what to do together. And lastly, groups is the third way that we can grow. And, and groups promote growth. I don't have time to go into this a lot. Um, I would love to go into major detail about groups, but that's why I do trainings throughout the year on this. Um, the, the downfall to, spirit, uh, to groups is that spiritual fellowship can kind of be lost a little bit because the larger the group gets, the, the less you feel like you can trust everyone to share things. But here's what I tell people. Um, when you get in groups, you get to meet a couple people to break off with and go have dinner with and have coffee or get real with. So sometimes we need to start in groups to find the one or two people we can trust. Okay? So that's why sometimes for me, when I encourage people to get together, I sometimes just start with a group because in that group you can learn who would be in your corner to help you. What I love about groups is the life that is shared among each other where everyone in the group can edify or build each other up is just incredible. So here's what, here's what that means real quick. Um, edification in the Bible means to build one another up, to promote Christian growth and Christian character. That's what, that's what the word edification means in the Bible. Groups allow the corporate church, like the large church, break down and be growth agents to others. And in the Bible, there are 59 one another statements or 39 one another's because there's repetitive ones. So 59 scriptures that instruct us to do something that edifies someone else. That's a lot. We can't fulfill 59 scripture references without being in community with other people. Think about that for a second. Isn't that interesting? There's a ton of scripture we can't apply and live out if we don't live in community, like groups or for spiritual fellowship. And uh, Andy Stanley said this, when everyone is sitting in rows, you can't do any one another's. So he said a similar thing as Jerry Bridges said. It's very hard for you to do a one another right now. In other words, is what he's saying. But as soon as you get in groups, as soon as you get in spiritual fellowship, you are able to quadruple the scriptures you can live out and now pour into other people. And here's some of them. Uh, be at peace with each other. Love one another. I love this one. Wash one another's feet. <laughs> That was, that was uh, Jesus in the upper room with the disciples. In other words, what he was saying is serve one another. I wouldn't want someone touching my feet. I'm just going to say it out loud. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Love one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you. Instruct one another. Here's an interesting one. You know, only do this with your spouse. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 
I mean, they did, I think what it was is they, you know, side to side, like Italian style, you know. <laughs> we don't really do that in America. That's an invading my privacy, okay? So I don't want any. But some, some grandmas give me kisses like, you know, that's fine, on the cheek, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Number 17, have equal concern for each other. Greet, oh, another one, another holy kiss, and another holy kiss. I guess we're behind here in America. How do we apply that scripture? Oh, yeah. How about a hug? A holy hug. You know what a holy hug is, right? A holy hug. It's a side hug. Side hugs. All right. Number 22. Uh, in 21, really, let's go with that. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, you will be destroyed by each other. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Carry each other's burdens. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Be kind and... Com These are the ones that hurt, you know? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So speak, speak songs and words of, of love over people. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Do not lie to each other. Bear with each other, which means to put up with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. He goes on and on and on in scripture. God is, God is saying that we have a lot of things we're supposed to do with each other that's meant to help someone grow. And the whole body of Christ gets to obey the commands to love God, love others, and make disciples. The whole body gets to use their gifts to edify and build each other up. I want to go to Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. We're almost done. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build the church, build up the church or edify the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until, all, until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. That's growth right there. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown away by every, about every, um, I'm sorry, blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Wow. In other words, when you do your part, you help the entire church body, not just in this building, but every body around Delaware, every church. When we do our part, we help the body of Christ thrive. And that's why I said that earlier, that when we're not in the game helping other people grow, we're actually hurting the body of Christ or hurting people come to know Christ. When we, when we get knocked out, so to say, and we're sidelined or we're in the medic room and we're getting worked on, let God work on you. Let God work on you and let people help you. You know, do, don't deny help. I don't know if you do, but don't deny help. Let people speak truth in your life. Let them speak scripture in your life right? Let them care for you, right? So you can get back out there because you're meant to impact this world. First Peter 4.10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. I love that verse. We use that in next steps because I want you to know something. This means that every single person is like a grace dispenser for God. Every single one of us can dispense the grace of God in its various forms. There's not just one way that we show 
God's love and grace. Some of us are more encouraging. Some of us show kindness. Some of us are patient. Some of us have the gift of healing. Some of us have the gift of words of knowledge. Some of us have the gift of leadership. When you live in the role you're supposed to live, that God's called you to live, you're dispensing God's grace on earth, which has transformed the world. He sees you worthy enough of being used by him to change this world. Every single one of you in here can be, cha- or can be world changers and change lives. Because his grace works through us. So tonight I was really just trying to encourage us to grow by being in community where we get to actually live out scripture and live out the Christian life. And that last quote on the bottom says, everyone has the potential to grow exponentially if we be the church, not just go to church. If we be the church, not just go to church. So tonight, when we spend time around this altar in our seats, I want you to not just think of yourself tonight. I want you to think of the people that you're supposed to pour into and minister to. And I want you to think about, yes, what... God, you know, if there's some last minute things here, because this is the last night of Grow Conference, if there's some last minute things I need to patch up, do it tonight. I, I surrender it. I surrender it. Because I want to make a difference in this world. I want to help others follow Jesus. So I surrender that to you. I'm actually going to ask our, our any prayer team members, any pastors, my young adult leaders who want to come up that, that, that you can pray. Just go ahead and... Um, This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray over you and then you can hang out at the altars as well. But I want them to spread out in front of the altar here to receive people, to pray over them because we're gonna pray for a few things. We're gonna pray for the Holy Spirit's power to be upon you, to be witnesses. We're gonna pray that God equips you, that God gives you the boldness and the courage to pour into people's lives. Some of you may have insecurities that you can't do this. Don't listen to that. Do not listen to that. Pastor Ryan didn't start at perfection. I didn't start serving people once I knew expert level of scripture references. I couldn't even find Ecclesiastes tonight. (laughs) Jody, he's incredible at memorizing scripture. Pastor is incredible at knowing where scripture is and explaining scripture. I'm not like them. That doesn't mean anything. God uses me in different ways. Do not look at us. We learned this week that we're becoming like Christ, not like Pastor Kuhn. God wants to use you. Jesus used some messed up people, didn't he? I mean, Mary Magdalene, right? Woman at the well who ends up going and sharing the gospel with the town and they all come to know Christ, right? He used them. You had the disciples who were really rough around the edges. Do not count yourself out. And I want, I want you to start with this. Begin to grow by helping other people grow. Because here's the reality. If you've been in church longer than a year and you've been listening every week, you already have a lot to start with. Compared to someone on the street that knows diddly squat about anything when it comes to Jesus. Right? Right? I mean, when I, went, when I had a meeting, I've already told you this story, but it happens more than once. When I had a meeting with someone, and it was a young man, and he was like, I need help to know where to find the scripture, where to find the book Ephesians. That was his meeting with me. I was like, we could have done that over the phone, bro, but that's all right. But I took that time to go, you know, go through some things with him, right? But think about that. You could have done that. You could have gone to the front of the Bible, looked at table contents, found the number, just like you helped me out tonight, and then show him what Ephesians talks about. Like read through it and go, look at this verse that really sticks out to me. Does it stick out to you? We can do this. And Jesus wants us to become more like him. God wants us to become more like him. The Holy Spirit will come into you to become more like him so that you can help other people know Christ and become like Christ. It's just full circle, isn't it? And we, we purposely did this tonight with this topic because truly, if you want to grow, 
and if you're bored with the way your Christian life is and if, if you really feel like it's not fulfilling, it's because you're always meant to start that journey with Jesus Christ where you help other people follow him. There's nothing better as a pastor, right, Pastor Coon? There's nothing greater as a pastor than to lead someone to Jesus Christ and help them grow spiritually to the point that they help other people grow. There is nothing more exciting than watching a whole family come to Christ because one mom or one dad or a grandparent came to Christ. That's what we live for here. That's what we want. So tonight, God wants to anoint you with his power. He wants to restore you. By the way, the Holy Spirit isn't just for power, but the Holy Spirit is a refining fire that cleanses and burns away the old past of your life. And his power comes over you and he'll gift you with courage and boldness and his spiritual gift to, to be used to reach people. So I'm not going to delay this any longer. You're going to hear worship songs. I want to encourage you to worship, but I also want to encourage you to pray and let people pray for you. And let's cover each other in prayers because souls are at stake. Souls are at stake on whether we go out there and start making disciples or not. Amen. God, I pray over this time right now that you would move by your spirit. Fill us, Lord God. We receive, we open our hearts, Lord. We wanna grow. We want, we want the more that you have for us in your Holy Spirit. We know there's more to this Christian life than just receiving for ourselves. So God, make us ready. We love you, God. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.